Hey all, Alex here at your home of the Music Deep Dive, and today it's time for another discography ranking. Today we are going to be ranking the albums released by none other than one of America's greatest crooners, Billy Holiday. Billy Holiday, born Eleanor Fagan the 7th of April 1915 in Philadelphia, died the 17th of July 1959 in New York City. Born into poverty and subjected to a chaotic upbringing where she spent time in a juvenile detention center and was raped at the age of 11, Holiday came into her own in Harlem as a teenager, performing at nightclubs and eventually becoming one of the scene's most vibrant young vocalists. Not only was she a star of the live performing scene, but she became a recording star as well thanks to her records with various Columbia record labels and subsidiaries in the 30s and early 40s, collaborating with other artists such as Teddy Wilson and recording the song that to this day is perhaps her best known work, Strange Fruit. There's a lot that could be said about Strange Fruit. It came out in 1939 and this track was a powerful moment in the history of black popular music, a very straightforward acknowledgement of racism in the form of a popular record and how racism manifests itself in the ugliest possible forms, the most horrific possible forms, and its success, because uh, it was a successful single, turned Holiday into a national star and really something close to a civil rights icon even at the time. Holiday retained that popularity and notoriety as she spent time with other labels, including both Decca and Verve Records, but a lifetime of drug and alcohol abuse in addition to numerous abusive relationships left her life in a constant state of turmoil, wrecking her voice and necessitating a few stints in rehab, as well as a couple of trips to prison. She died at the age of 43 in 1959 in awful health, broke, and in handcuffs awaiting trial for charges of narcotics possession. But despite the tragic ignominy of her later years, Holiday's image was well respected by a great deal of her peers, with luminaries such as uh, Frank Sinatra ranking her among the greatest singers of the 20th century, perhaps some of the greatest to ever live. Now there is a moment of full disclosure that needs to happen when talking about Billie Holiday's career. Her discography is one that is impossible to properly discuss purely in the context of album releases. So much of her best material comes from the sides that she recorded during her Columbia days. It's the period of time when her voice is at its brightest, its most youthful, when her instrument was really at the height of its powers. And I do not say that at all to dismiss the records that we are talking about here. They are all at the very least fine records, they're all worthwhile listens, and some of them do rate among the very best things that she ever put to tape. It's just that we have to understand that to appreciate her catalog fully will require you to dig into the Columbia and even the Decca singles a bit. There are some absolutely fantastic recordings in there, some of the very best music coming out in that period of time. We have 12 albums that we are going to talk about here today. It's actually a pretty straightforward a discography to compile compared to some of the other artists releasing material at this time. There is one album that I am not going to be including in here, and that is her 1947 self-titled release on Commodore Records. It is an excellent record with um, a very strong bit of song selection. However, it is comprised of previously used singles, so it fits more into the compilation category. It doesn't really sit amongst anything else we're going to be talking about very comfortably, so I am going to be excluding it. Uh, but otherwise, pretty straight ahead list here, so why don't we just go ahead and get right on into it. At number 12, and I want to be clear here that all of these records, I think, are at the very least quite decent, so nothing bad here. I would recommend all of these on some level to everybody. Um, but at the bottom, something had to be there. I do have 1953's An Evening with Billie Holiday. Uh, her early 50s records probably could be argued as a little bit indistinguishable from each other on some level. Uh, to me, this is the album where you start to hear the vocal decline a little bit. It's starting to get a little bit noticeable. Um, and that's going to become more pronounced over time, but you, you do start to get the uh, early senses of that here. Um, one thing that really brings this album down a little bit for me is that a lot of these songs do have um, 
um, recordings that she did earlier on, perhaps with different record labels. Um, and generally speaking, I prefer all of the earlier versions to these. Um, we're going to come back to that in other records as well. Um, and I do see a benefit in these versions with the slightly raspier approach that she's taking in her vocals. I do like the rendition of Stormy Weather on here. Uh, the song Yesterdays, um, I really like the organ that's added on here. I think that's kind of a unique touch. But otherwise, for the most part, it's a solid album. Um, and it's well sung, well played. Uh, but it is probably the most anonymous of her records, and that's what kind of brings it down a little bit for me. So solid enough, but uh, it is my bottom in Evening with Billie Holiday. Number 11, I have 1954's self-titled record. Um, this is a pretty strong collection of Torch songs. You're going to hear me say that a lot because that is really her bread and butter, are these really slow-moving uh, Torch songs. Probably my favorite on here is Autumn in New York. I really love how the vocals are ghosted by the uh, piano playing on here. It's a really, really great touch. Um, one kind of weakness about this record compared to um, other albums from this period, a couple of these early records have songs that are taken from recording sessions spanning over several years. So you'll have a record that was released in 1954 in this case. There are songs that were actually recorded a couple of years earlier. Um, the majority of these tracks are from the 1952 sessions in this case. Um, and then the last, I think the last three are from the 1954 session. I think the last three tracks are absolutely the weakest here. Uh, and that kind of difference in quality uh, makes this a little bit inconsistent, a little bit front loaded. Um, but again, strong moments. I do like the rendition of Love for Sale here as well. Um, you know, it's solid enough, um, but we are dealing with greatness to come. So it's only my number 11 self-titled record, but still a solid release. Number 10, I have 1958's Stay With Me. I should say that I am using the Wikipedia release dates for these albums. Uh, Wikipedia and Rate Your Music do not line up. Uh, so I'm going to go with Wikipedia on this one. Um... Stay With Me is interesting. This record is entirely made up of tracks from uh, sessions that occurred in 1955, so three years prior. And I think because of that, when you compare it to the album surrounding it, uh, this kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. It feels out of date. Um, Holiday's voice does feel noticeably healthier here compared to other uh, records, but um, I don't think performance-wise, arrangement-wise, this is quite on par with the other stuff she was doing in the late 50s. I think even if you compare this to the other mid-50s records that she was doing, um, these aren't among her best recordings from that period. I will say, though, I've got my love to keep me warm. Uh, I think she recorded that a couple of times, and she owns it every time she records it, and the rendition on this album is no exception. So, Stay With Me is my number 10. Number nine, I have 1956's Velvet Mood. Uh, this record is compiled from these same recording sessions that produced music for Torching. Um, and obviously, I don't like this album quite as much since I do have music for Torching a bit higher. Uh, but I, what I will say to Velvet Mood's credit is that this song selection seems a little bit more dynamic. I don't think it's a stronger selection per se. Uh, but there's a little bit more variety. There's a little bit more up-tempo material here. Uh, stuff like Please Don't Talk About Me When I'm Gone, I think is some of the best up-tempo material that she does during this period. Um, and one thing I will say, too, is I do think her forte is the Torch songs, and there are times when I don't think that Holiday doing up-tempo music entirely works because she doesn't seem entirely natural with it. But when she does it well, when it hits, it hits really hard. Um, and I think Please Don't Talk About Me When I'm Gone is a great example of that. I also love I Got a Right to Sing the Blues. That is a traditional city blues number. Um, Holiday really leaning into that Bessie Smith influence here and does it so well. Just feels so comfortable in that style. And I really wish she was able to explore that more, at least in this kind of later period. I just think it's absolutely fantastic. So uh, it's already my number nine, uh, Velvet Mood, or only my number nine, I should say. Uh, but it is a solid release um, and worth your time. Number eight, I have 1958's All or Nothing at All. Um, this, I would say, is actually one of her more smooth and consistent records overall. Um, more straight ahead, I suppose. 
and I wouldn't frame that as a bad thing. I think this plays to her strength, so I wouldn't dare refer to this as dull. It's nothing close to that. I will say it is long. It is her longest record, clocking in at slightly over 50 minutes. Um, so you're going to be spending a bit of time here, um, but it is well worth your time. Um, there are some strong tracks here, strong recordings. I like her rendition of Cheek to Cheek. Uh, we'll be together again. April in Paris is good. I really like Speak Low. That's a unique rendition. There's a few different tempo changes on this track that make it among her more dynamic late career uh, recordings. That's one thing that I think separates the best jazz vocalists from kind of the mediocrity, I suppose, being able to handle those tempo changes, key changes, obviously, um, and just kind of glide through them. Um, when I talked about Sinatra's discography, that's something Sinatra excelled at. Clearly, he took significant inspiration and would have been the first to admit it, uh, took significant inspiration from Billie Holiday. Um, I think she sounds so natural in that setting, whether it's in the song Speak Low, whether that's in any other song with a tempo change, I think it's absolutely fantastic. So all or nothing at all, number eight. Number seven, I have 1959's uh, self-titled release, uh, although you'll probably hear it referred to more as Last Recording. Uh, this is the uh, last record that she released. It was released uh, posthumously shortly after her death. Um, it is a strong final effort. Uh, Ray Ellis, who did the arrangements, uh, orchestral arrangements for Lady in Satin, he comes back here um, to produce some more arrangements. And it's a really interesting release in that while Lady in Satin is very much sweeping orchestral arrangements, very unique for Holiday in that sense, uh, last recording mixes jazz with those kind of string backgrounds, uh, which I think is a very, very interesting mixture. Now, the reason why I don't think it's quite among the upper echelon of her albums is because I'm not crazy about the song selection, really. Um, I don't think these were songs that she sounds super, super natural in sometimes. Uh, her vocals are also a little bit interesting. Um, she is very worn down when you get to the late 50s, you listen to the records from this period, but her vocals sound really smooth here. They're feeble, for sure. I mean, they're not powerful, but they're not raspy in the same way that they were. Uh, it's kind of an interesting change. Um, but there are some strong highlights. I really like When It's Sleepy Time Down South. Uh, her rendition of I'll Never Smile Again is the penultimate track on here, and I think is a really powerful way to help close out a brilliant career. Um, so yeah, a little bit um, underlooked, I suppose, overlooked rather, uh, but you know, you get a lot here and it's a strong release that I would recommend, um, although I do think there are other material, other records from this period that are slightly preferable. So last recording, number seven. Number six, I have the, uh, I guess technically the debut full-length album, 1952's Billie Holiday Sings. Um, it's a really strong release. Um, it's definitely the strongest record vocally in this period, or the healthiest record vocally anyways. Um, you have Holiday's vocals mixed with a really terrific ensemble. That's one thing that um, really is to the credit of most of these albums, certainly the jazz albums. The ensemble playing is terrific. You have Barney Kessel on guitar here. Um, Oscar Peterson on piano for some of these early records. Oscar Peterson, one of my favorite jazz pianists of all time, um, really adds some great backings and tasteful solos here and there. It just works out beautifully. Um, there's quite a few solid songs on this record. Uh, the rendition of Solitude on here I think is really nice, but the absolute highlight for me, uh, one of my favorite recordings from this entire deep dive, is the version of These Foolish Things. Uh, this is Holiday singing with only Peterson on the piano backing her, and the two of them play off each other so well. It is just an absolutely beautiful, exquisite bit of counterpoint, I suppose you could say. And nothing else on here quite compares to that, but the peak here is so absolutely fantastic that it definitely bumps this record up a couple of notches for me. Uh, quality vocal jazz record from the period. Uh, great stuff. Billy Holiday sings my number six. Number five, I have 1955's Music for Torching. Um, you pretty much get what is advertised here. Um, these are a collection of torch songs, holiday duetting with all these backing instrumentations, some great saxophone, some great trumpet here, 
doing these like call and response figures with her. Uh, it's a very intimate record. Uh, you really feel that kind of proximity effect for vocals. Like you feel like Holiday and the instrumentalists are getting like right next to the microphone. Um, it's a really effective technique. It's a really effective feel. Um, this is one of the records where it's actually tough for me to pick a standout because I think this is an incredibly consistent album. I do think the rendition of It Had to Be You is pretty fantastic. Um, I Don't Stand a Ghost of a Chance with You. A Fine Romance is great. It's just, it's a very consistent mood album. And if that's what you're going for, um, you certainly could get that with several records on this list, but I think this might be for the, the this might be your best option. Um, to get a consistent mood. So, Music for Torching. Again, not top tier, Billy, but we're getting close. This is strong stuff, so highly recommended. Number four, I have 1957's Body and Soul. A um, little bit more of an upbeat bent on this one compared to the average holiday record. You have Ben Webster joining on the sax here. Um, I think between him and Peterson, it's between the two of them for the most accomplished sideman on any of these records. Um, he's a great addition, adds some really fantastic stuff, Embraceable You, um, that track has some absolutely fantastic bits of soloing. Um, it's a strong record front to back, um, Body and Soul, the opening track is absolutely fantastic, clear highlight. Um, I also really love some of the flourishes and little accents that they do in the song Comes Love, Darn That Dream is really good, Moonlight in Vermont is a solid closer. Um, it's sort of it's an interesting record because it's kind of diminished by the records that are surrounding it being so strong but uh body and soul to me is a clear next step after you've heard what probably are considered the three main classics of her discography um and it's not at all really much of a step down um it's there's some fantastic performances her voice again fragile raspy but still strong still melding in with that ensemble really well um, it's a great album, Body and Soul number four. And now we get to the top three, which are really, uh, like I said, probably the three most famous, the three most essential Billie Holiday records, and for good reason. Um, I would say any order for these top three would make sense on some level. Right now, my number three is going to be 1956's Lady Sings the Blues. Um, this was released in tandem with her autobiography of the same name, which came out that same year. And really the goal of this record seems to be um, kind of creating this retrospective of Holiday's entire career up to that point. There are several re-recordings of songs that she made famous, some of her biggest hits. And I think why I put this down a little bit is that I don't know if many, if any of the re-recordings really match up to the originals. I mean, you have stuff like Strange Fruit on here. God Bless the Child, two of her very best songs. They're damn near impossible to replicate, at least if we're looking to imitate the atmosphere of the originals. But there is something different about these interpretations. I think her vocals at this point are so frayed and so worn that the reinterpretations make sense, and I think they add a different level of perspective. This is Strange Fruit sung from the vantage point of somebody who is now almost 20 years older, 20 years beyond what um, that young woman in 1939 was singing about. Um, so it's a fantastic and fascinating lens to view this record through. Uh, but this album does contain one obvious career highlight that is new to this, and that is the title track. I think that is a masterpiece of a track. The dramatic trumpet that's on here is really kind of the cornerstone, those little fanfares and, again, call and response type of figures. And the song itself really feels like a reflection. It seems to be kind of the thesis statement of the record, uh, reflecting on her legacy, reflecting on her life. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic stuff. Um, so it's a compelling album, front to back. Um, only number three, because I think the two above it are just that extra little bit more um, enticing for me. But Lady Sings the Blues gets the strongest of recommendations from me. Uh, my number three. Number two is perhaps somewhat controversial, 1958's Lady in Satin. Um, this is her most famous album. It is the record that I think has 
stood the test of time and is usually people's first Billie Holiday record when they go to her. Um, and it's not hard to see why it's the last one that she released before she died. There is that sort of tragic connotation there. Um, it is also fascinating in the sense that it is stylistically totally different from anything else she ever did. Um, she works with Ray Ellis on the orchestral arrangements. This is just an orchestra with her, no real jazz backing. Um, and the goal really seems to have been to try to do a Sinatra-like thing. I know they were initially talking about Nelson Riddle doing the arrangements. And Ellis's arrangements do sort of feel like a Nelson Riddle light type of imitation. Um, and I see how people, like, there's obvious influence there. And I see how people say that this does sound like In the Wee Small Hours on some level. I think that does track to an extent. But I do think overall the moods and the feelings you get when you come away from the records are different. I think In the Wee Small Hours is a very in its feelings type of record. It is very like moody and glum. I think Lady in Satin is more stately. I don't think it quite digs into the same sorrows. It just sort of feels, um, you know, regal and tragic and worn. Um, I think part of the reason why it doesn't maybe dig into those same emotional depths that Sinatra does is because Holiday's voice cannot handle it. To me, you compare this record to even the records that came just before this um, in that same year, and even here, Holiday's vocals, they sound more exposed. They sound weaker than ever. Um, you can hear the kind of raspy breath as she's like drawing those breaths close to the microphone, and it's so vulnerable and so fascinating and there is a I suppose a compelling sort of tragedy in that setting that really makes the album feel like an epitaph and that's clearly where the staying power is um, this feels like a um, gargantuan final statement for uh, one of the great musical artists of the first half of the 20th century now I will say that I called Ray Ellis's orchestral arrangements sort of Nelson Riddle light I do think they're pretty lightweight. The dynamics here don't compare to what Riddle was doing. They don't compare to like a Gordon Jenkins or anybody like that. Um, they're not bad. They're doing their best. But I think there is something to be said about the fact that this was by far the biggest project Ray Ellis ever worked on. He was never nearly as in demand of an arranger as someone like Riddle was. And that's what tempers my enjoyment of this record slightly. Um... But having said that, even though this is not a natural setting for Billie Holiday, and even though I do think she could have been given a little bit more to work with, what we get is still utterly compelling, fascinating, tragic, and it's a record that deserves all the acclaim that it's received. Um, so my not putting it number one um, has nothing to do with its quality. I would still highly recommend it, and if you want this to be your first Billie Holiday record, I say go for it. Just understand that going forward, your experience with her is going to be different. And I do think um, that is a good thing. I do mean that in a good way. So, Lady in Satin, it's fantastic. Check it out. But it's only my number two. My number one, then, is also going to be from 1958. It is Songs for Distingue Lovers. Um... To me, this is the peak full-length Billie Holiday record because it is Holiday sounding her most natural uh, with the highest degree of musicianship surrounding her. Um, the ensemble performance, which is so good on all of these records, is absolutely fantastic here. Um, everyone in the band is just blowing their rear end off, whether it's Webster on the saxophone. Harry Edison on the trumpet, Kessel on the guitar, kind of the anchor throughout her whole discography. Um, it is so, so great. And it's also bolstered by an improved sound mix. This record sounds much better than most of the other ones that we have been talking about here. Um, if you listen to the stereo mix of it, I think that soundscape is so effective at portraying the intimacy of a jazz club. You really get to hear kind of the breaths, the breathiness of the instruments, as well as her voice. Um, it is so well done. Um, this is the last record to really feature kind of a smaller, um, kind of five, six piece ensemble. 
um, as opposed to larger groups of people. And again, they just, they're dynamite. They go out on top here. And the key, the key to being an effective jazz singer is to kind of be able to melt into that tapestry. I think you have a lot of people in this genre who, you know, they don't necessarily, I'm not going to say they don't treat their voice as an instrument, but it doesn't feel as natural. They're not agile. And you can tell that they sort of, they're, they're kind of a nice layering on top, but they don't really melt into the rest of it. Um, they're not kind of in sync on that level. Holiday melts into it. She melts into that tapestry so damn well um, and plays off of these instrumentalists so incredibly effectively. There's not a song on here that isn't just performed at the highest possible level. Uh, you have Day In, Day Out. I think that is an excellent tone setter for the record. Really gives you a sense of what's going to go on from there. A Foggy Day. Uh, in my mind, at least, one of the hardest jazz standards to sing because there's quite a few tempo changes, again, going back to that, but it's handled so adeptly, so well. Uh, one for My Baby and one more for The Road, maybe the sultriest number of all on this record, maybe the sultriest number of this entire catalog that I've reviewed so far, and I mean that in the most complimentary way possible. Um, Stars Fell in Alabama is fantastic. Um, and even if I would say that the album doesn't end quite as strong as it starts, um, this is still just such a strong bit of ensemble performing. I mean, it goes a little bit beyond just what Billy herself is bringing to the table. It is a collective. It is a collection of musicians bringing a piece of music, bringing a collection of songs to the highest levels of craftsmanship that they possibly can. And it's a marvel to listen to. So it's not her most affecting record by any means. There are definitely ones where um, there's more kind of tragedy in it again, more um, emotionality, I suppose. Uh, but to me, this is probably her best full length album on a technical level. It is remarkable. Cannot recommend it enough. Probably one of my favorite vocal jazz records of all time. Certainly one of my favorites of the 1950s. So. Songs for Distinguished Lovers is my number one. And with that, I want to thank you all so much for watching this video. Uh, going through Billie Holiday's whole discography was an absolute treat, uh, an absolute joy. I had heard most of these records going in, but to be able to really appreciate her catalog um, in this type of in-depth, laser-focused sense uh, was really rewarding and really goes to show that the a claim that she has received, I suppose, is incredibly well-deserved. And again, if you have time, I would highly recommend checking out a compilation of the sides that she did with Columbia, as well as with Decca. There's some remarkable, remarkable stuff there. Uh, I listened to that stuff before getting into this material, so as I could really, really have an appreciation for her aging, the decline of her voice, and yes, maybe miss what we had before you know feel sad because of her kind of wasting away but also kind of appreciate that transition um that kind of evolution as well you know you get to see kind of the whole story plan out, uh play out so um definitely recommend checking that out uh fantastic discography would highly recommend most of these albums really um and with that please make sure to like comment and subscribe more reviews, more rankings, always to come. Tell a friend as well. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time right here at your home of the Music Deep Dive.